Hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the National University of Singapore. And today I am really uh, glad to be here to moderate this uh, Ethos Books discussion. Uh, we are How We Eat, a discussion on food sustainability and history. So this um, panel was put together by Ethos Books um, in collaboration with the Singapore Heritage Festival. Um, it will focus on the importance and relevance of food in a climate crisis, as well as in our personal narratives. We hope that through this conversation, um, we will all make uh, connections with food and the larger Singaporean identity and society. So thank you very much um, to everyone who is joining us on Facebook Live. Today, we have the pleasure of uh, three distinguished speakers. Um, and these are um, some, of, some of them are probably quite familiar to you if you are in the food and sustainability uh, um, landscape. Um, so today, we have uh, with us Neil Xiaoyun. Um, Xiaoyun authored a chapter in Eating Chili Crab in the Anthropocene, actually the title chapter. Um, and she also um, volunteers or she works with Brown Up Initiative and that's where she'll be coming from today. We also have uh, Christopher Liao. Chris is an urban farmer. So he will be uh, sharing with everyone today about his experience as an urban farmer and some of his relevant projects. Um, and of course, we also have Hagar Sani. Um, he identifies as an Orang Laut and he'll be sharing with us today about his family and history um, as well as the experiences of Orang Laut people um, moving to the mainland Singapore from Pulau Semakau. So how this uh, session will take place, I will get each of the speakers to give us uh, a short introduction to themselves, uh, probably about five minutes uh, each person. Um, and perhaps you can first share with us about uh, yourself and what is your own relationship and history uh, with food and sustainability, just very briefly, and then we can go into the Q&A very shortly. So perhaps we can start with Xiaoyu. Cool. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so thanks Mel for the introduction. Uh, I'm Xiaoyun. Um, so by day, I am a policy officer. And, and when the office head comes off, I work overtime. <laughs> so, okay, just kidding. But what I mean is I find time for my other passions like environmental education and biodiversity conservation. So as Mel says, I'm a volunteer with Ground Up Initiative. We are a non-profit organization that is in the heartlands of Ishun and Katip. And we've been there for uh, the past 14 years. 13 years, sorry, 13 years. We just celebrated our birthday on Earth Day. Yeah, so um, basically what we believe in is connection. So connection with the Earth, connections with others, meaning other volunteers, and connection with yourself. And how we do that is we facilitate these connections via nature. Yeah, we do a lot of regenerative farming um, with natural farming practices. Um, and so we really believe in building a community for the community. So when I'm at GUI, I've been volunteering for the past two years. I lead sensory farm tours and harvesting programs. And over there, like participants can learn about where our food comes from and how much work goes into growing them. So actually, every session, I just strive to provide a safe space for participants to touch soil, to touch dirt, uh, microbes, earthworms, um, flowers, and of course, they produce and hope that that touches them too in the process. Because you know, studies have shown that human interaction and contact with nature actually helps to boost emotional health. Yeah, so um, that's where I come from, the farming side of it. Um, and of course, like maybe just segue a bit. Um, I believe that we cannot um, love, respect, or advocate for something that we don't know. That's why experiential learning is so important. Yeah. Um, and so how I got into the into the food specifically, or how I got to writing the essay was actually for the longest time, my twin interest was in environmentalism or sustainability and history. But I actually never knew how to bring the two together. I was quite clueless. So <laughs> I started off as a history major in year NUS, but I was chairing the year NUS um, sustainability movement. Yeah, and we're doing things like instituting green Mondays in our dining hall. So basically, we have three dining halls and on Monday, one of them is green, which later was so popular that it became green Wednesdays and green Fridays. And because I helped to bring it about, yeah, and uh, I thought that I also need to, yeah, like become vegetarian. So, and not just vegetarian on one day, but actually um, all the days, because why be vegetarian like 40% of the time? 
Um, okay, so I was then ending my second year of uni and um, I, I was still clueless, but I decided to follow my heart. Okay, quite cheesy, but it's true. So I did two study abroad programs in the Himalayas, one in Bhutan, one in India, and that spanned nearly six months because I just think that there's something about the outdoors that gets me in the zone flowing. Yeah, when I came back to Earth, okay, to Singapore, I decided, okay, time to focus. So I did actually all my history requirements and I decided to choose one environmental studies module and that was Environmental Humanities with Prof. Schneider Mayerson. And actually that really changed me because I learned about the role of arts and humanities in responding to the climate and environmental crisis. So basically, I think a fundamental cultural shift is very important to adequately address these pressing issues. And culture is studied, expressed, and also shaped by arts and humanities. So long and short, this was actually the module that inspired the essay, Eating Chili Crab in the Anthropocene. Yeah, so here's the book. <laughs> yeah, it's actually published by Ethos Books, and you can grab a copy of it. So I think actually that's how I got started. And of course, Grand Initiative continues to show me the importance of knowing where our food comes from and and of course, supporting local farms and also like um, passing on these farming practices, which I can elaborate more on later. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Yun. Yes, I uh, got a copy of the book, uh, Eating Chili Crab and Anthropocene, and I helped to moderate the launch. And at the, at the time I was sharing that I read the book in like a day and a half. I was so enamored and I continued to be really inspired by the authors of the book and you know, how you've taken the narrative, um, you know, to the Singaporean public. Uh, and, and what I was extremely pleased with, um, having worked in the area of climate change for so long, is I said that it's the first time I'm seeing, you know, so many young people. I mean, the, the book was authored by people who are between 22 and 27 years old. Uh, and so this really changes things, right? Um, so, so really glad that uh, you're part of that project uh, with Matthew and, and his and other authors. So we can get back to the book a bit later. Um, but perhaps now I can ask uh, Chris uh, to introduce himself with you. And um, Chris, how did you get involved in food and sustainability? Hey, Mel. Um, yeah, so I've spent the last probably 10 years uh, involved in food and I've uh, ventured everything from all, all different parts of the food chain. So I've uh, started out as a chef um, and then as a trader and um, also as an urban farmer. Um, and how I got started, um, I, I did uh, travel uh, for about seven months, backpack around the world. And I was, that was my discovery uh, trip to understand how food, uh, how food comes from, where food comes from and how it's grown. Uh, what really changed uh, my perspective was when I lived with a family in Australia that were, they were self-sufficient uh, completely. So all their energy, um, food, um, uh, everything was, was uh, created on, on the land that they, they grew. And, and that sort of made me think, oh, could there be a different way that we could live uh, back here in Singapore? And so the lessons uh, that I've learned, I, I came back to Singapore and uh, ever since I've been advocating for this uh, movement where we could be more self-sufficient. Um, currently, I'm with a new startup called Boodles, where it's uh, a concept that combines um, farming. Uh, we, have a, we have a kitchen. I may also do uh, a retail. So it does uh, accumulate all my different experiences in food in this space. Hey, wonderful. We'll get into that a bit later, Chris. All right. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of your urban farming projects uh, during the Q&A. So last but not least, of course, we have Fadal Sunny. Um, he is, uh, well, I'll let, I'll let him introduce himself real quick. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so my name is Fadal. I am a fourth generation Orang Laut. Um, I started the project around Laut SG in the time of COVID. I think the silver lining is that I had a little bit more time. Uh, I had I kick started this idea because I always wanted to do this for the longest time. It's just that you know I had work, um, and then COVID comes along and it's really bad, but also it's really good for me personally because I'm able to be closer to my family as well. So during this session, whereby I have a lot of you know family dinners at home, uh, we talk about food a lot. We talk about um, you know, the stories that my mom used to share, such as 
you know, um, how a piece of fish would end up on the table and how she would go on catching that fish at Pulau Macau. So a little bit of history, my family used to live in Pulau Macau till the year 1977 when they were relocated in Singapore at about, um, I think, mid-1977 or so. So during that time of 1977 to 1991, my grandparents still visited the island a lot. Um, I think they almost lived there for quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to be part of this journey. I was able to be exposed to the life of, of an orang laut uh, growing up in Pulau Semakau together with my grandparents. They taught me how to fish. They taught me about the seascape and also the kind of biodiversity that the islands, the southern islands used to have. Um, I think I kickstarted these projects because I, I want to be able to um, reclaim our narrative, right? I think uh, from the orang laut perspective, uh, the history has always been written for us and not by us. So I hope as a fourth generation Orang Laut, I am able to give like more in-depth view of what we believe and, and our culture and a little bit more about our history and why it's so important to us. Right now, Pulau Macau is a landfill, but to us it is more than that. And I am basically just the middleman, you know, sharing the stories of my family members. Um, and it is an ongoing project that I kickstarted um, and this will be ongoing hopefully next few years or so. Um, I think just to touch on a little bit more about food, um, food is something that is really important to us. At the island itself at Pulau Macau, our diet mostly consists of seafood and vegetables that can be found on the island. Uh, through the years, especially during conversations like what I've shared earlier, uh, we, they would reveal a little bit more about you know, where the food, the food would come from. And there's always a story behind every dish and stories such as how they used to catch crabs uh, at the mangroves of Samarkau, or they would tell me about the different fishing and preparation methods for our families, Asam Pedas, for example. So food is really important to me because it reflects a certain time of our lives, our livelihood, and I want to be able to use food as a vehicle to talk about who we are and talk about our identity and it also help to shape our narrative as well. You're actually getting me a bit hungry uh, right now. I'm talking about Assam. <laughs> I um, actually recently went to the um, Human Ex Nature, Human and Nature exhibition um, that's currently ongoing at uh, the National Library on the 10th floor. And uh, I, I know that uh, you and your, some of your, your community and your family members were featured in a video and write up. Um, on the Orang Lawats, uh, which is really interesting. I would encourage everyone to go and take a look at that exhibition. It's on until the 26th of September. Um, and uh, I really learned a lot by listening to that, that short video. Actually, and we'll come back to that in a bit. So for the next segment, um, for around 40, 45 minutes, what we'll do is I will be moderating a discussion session with our panelists. We will be unpacking and interrogating humans, uh, or rather Singaporeans' relationship with food here in Singapore. And to start us off, um, I will ask Xiaoyun a question, but before that, I would probably note that. Um, so if you guys are on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to Slido. And that's where I would encourage you to put in your questions that you have as you listen to our speakers, share a little bit more about food, sustainability and history. Please put in your, your questions on Slido and we'll access them and ask them a bit later on. Okay? Cool. So the first question um, I would love to ask Xiaoyun is um, why did you pick the iconic chili crab as an example of how intertwined and complex our history is with the food that we eat? Um, to you, right, why, what does eating chili crab in the Anthropocene really mean? And do you think that we can continue eating chili crab, right, in the Anthropocene? And what can we expect, um, you know, if let's say uh, we talk about crab populations, right? Um, do you think that in a climate crisis, we should still be um, buying into this uh, chili crab kind of, uh, you know, I think you can explain a little bit more as to why uh, and, and share a little bit more about the, the thinking behind your chapter um, and some of your thinking behind why you also became vegetarian. I know you managed to share with us a little bit earlier. So I'll, I'll uh, pose that question to you first. Uh, sorry, sorry. 
Okay, hi. Okay, so firstly, uh, I love crab. <laughs> okay, more importantly, I want to be readable to a general audience. And honestly, what's more Singaporean than food? So I think food is really so central to Singaporean culture and identity, in particular seafood, as Fidel's mentioned. So actually, the chili crab dish is really a hook. Um, and I really want to recreate for my readers that sense of wonder when I realize all the different ways that we are related to crab. So I, I guess um, maybe, maybe we can take a step back to look at the crab, right? The crab, when it's presented, um, you can, that's the last stage of its um, life. Well, but actually, uh, if you think about where it comes from, actually most of our crabs are Scylla serrata. That is the giant mud crab, which is imported from, uh, we call them Sri Lankans, but actually they are imported from all around the world now because of our huge um, and expanding demand for the food. Not just us, but I guess also like, uh, rising countries like China, right? So um, actually we import from, you know, India, Sri Lanka, you know, even like Myanmar, like Indochina countries, and as far as the East Coast of Africa. So that's the crab. But locally, we also have our own species of crabs that are um, also skillers, but not as big. Like um, the mud crab is like 28 cm long, right? We have the local crabs, which the long run would probably caught, and they grew up to 20 cm. So we have three, um, three Scylla species, um, the orange, green, and the purple. And um, these crabs are probably the ones that the settlements of Arong Lao would use to catch, um, you know, all the way in the 19th century. So they were eating crab even before us. But if we think about how, um, it's not just the crab, but it actually influenced their culture. Maybe he will share more as well. But um, you know, it influences like the things that you use to catch the crab. It influences how, um, you know, crabs are really seen as very important because you can actually use them to butter trade with the communities that are living on the mainland because they are bigger and they have more protein. Yeah, so they are considered more valuable. So, um, you know, when you look at uh, symbols of the crab, for instance, in earlier early 20th century Pranagan Chinese culture, you actually see a lot of these like... Um, motifs of crabs carved in gold that is used as uh, decorations for their for their costumes yeah because i was looking at some artifacts for nhb uh, talk slightly later in the month so i learned about all these ways that you know local culture uh, different communities in singaporean culture uh, value the crab but uh if i would take us even further back into history um you know um about 100 and 65 million years ago, uh, along the coast of Africa, um, they were they discovered like archaeologists discovered this huge pile of middens. So middens are actually uh, discarded shells. After you finish the, the shellfish, you finish the crab, you throw away the the shell. So these huge piles of middens were found a lot of, in a lot of places in Africa, and that actually coincided with the migration out of um, Africa. They followed the coast. That's actually like a favorable route of uh, migration out of Africa. So I think it's really fascinating that um, I think it just has influenced us, you know, uh, in more ways than one. So, um, you know, I myself was enthralled and I wanted to re, um, reproduce this uh, wonder for everyone. My hope is that by conveying this understanding, it can be the basis of a new respect and appreciation for how we're so related to the non-human world both food related, but also beyond consumption. Okay, maybe go into the Anthropocene. It's actually quite a long word. Um, it just means the era where we find ourselves as the dominant force on Earth, where um, you know, our impacts on Earth can actually be found uh, like to impact the geologic structure. You know, if future humans, thousand years from now, excavate, um, you know, they do like soil cores or they do like ice block cores, they can actually see the the impact of um, the current generation, meaning from the industrial revolution to, to present day until we decarbonize probably. So um, the Anthropocene uh, is just characterized by things like climate change, deforestation, widespread plastic pollution, amongst other things. And so why bring the chili crab and the Anthropocene? Actually, it's in intentional because we actually want to get people thinking about how global environmental problems are uh, also not just something happening far away, but also happening in Singapore. It's happening here and now. It might affect you not as, you know, just the impacts are not the same. Um, some people probably experience it more and um, and some not as much, but it's, yeah, it's not something far away. So um, the question was really long. You also asked whether we could eat chili crab. Um, 
Okay, so when I was doing research, I think, I think uh, technically and probably yes, in the short term, we're pretty innovative. Uh, I found a few ways that the restaurants have adapted to supply crunches. So House of Seafood, they have vacuum packed crabs and they have ample stock ample stocks of these vacuum packed crepes um, and Jumbo has 20 crepe suppliers from five countries so I think that's how they um, get over the supply crunches which have been happening so as bad as bad weather conditions and over harvesting happens actually some of the supplies in some months has dwindled by 30 percent um, higher temperatures in general has also resulted in more crabs dying so um, it has actually led to some countries uh, harvesting juveniles. So I believe that it's probably not viable in the long term. And this is not just for crabs, but across all our key ingredients, like you can think about how climate change is also affecting our rice, our fish, our coffee, so on and so forth. And so um, I think that's why the crab was the uh, conduit to think about how we can try to transition to a low seafood and meat consumption lifestyle in Singapore, which I understand will be very difficult because we are extremely carnivorous. I would say even as I transition to the work life, I've been working for two years, um, I've had to be more flexitarian. Yeah, it's just, you just have to socialize with people and, and not all the restaurants have good vegetarian options. So, um, but it's it's a matter of um you know realizing that you can have some days where you're entirely vegetarian and it shouldn't be just an individual thing actually it should be a cultural and societal wide norm um so that's actually why i wrote the essay you know we should start thinking about how we can change norms okay thank you i hope i answered everything yes. if i didn't okay you did. <laughs> thank excellent you. i am so pleased that you shared um and very eloquently as well um so i'm i i i'm not actually a so yeah i really quite different to um but but in terms of what you said and what really struck me was how climate change is affecting uh, food supply right and, and earlier we talked about how sometimes climate change is such a far off topic for regular Singaporeans, and this is also some of the complaints that we get, right, like that people are not uh, inspired to act. Um, but food, food is such a, uh, you know, so emotive to a lot of Singaporeans, right? Uh, you know, I don't have to go into detail, but you know how we get worked up about food, right? Particularly with our neighbours, so, uh, who has the best, so and so. Um, so I wonder, right, so we talked about um, food supply, uh, food security. And as you all know, um, during the pandemic, um, food supply was affected in Singapore because we import nearly everything, right? And that led to our government uh, announcing the... Um, actually, it was announced slightly before the pandemic, but it became even more apparent that we needed to um, use the... So we had this 30 by 30 target here in Singapore, which is to um, grow 30% of our nutritional needs by the year 2030. And so I thought that would be a great segue to Chris, right? Chris can perhaps share with us about, um, as an urban farmer, right, and in your role to uh, look at this landscape, um, how do you think that the 30 by 30 uh, target can be met? Um, separately, there's also a new plan, right? We call this the Chris Singapore Green Plan. Um, I wonder perhaps if you can uh, give us a breakdown of um, how you view this plan and whether you think it's helpful in the um, urban farming landscape here in Singapore. All right. Thanks, Mel. Um, I think uh, the, the question about food uh, sustainability and self-sufficiency, it's actually a very, very complex one. Um, so, I'll just unpack that a little bit first, because I, I think to directly answer you whether or not we can uh, hit that target is, is a bit difficult. So I think, I think firstly is um, to be self-sufficient is to use whatever we have in our resource base. Um, and and uh, for example, not importing stuff, right? But we, we live in a very um, difficult position because uh, we have in our DNA been traders all along. And so if we were, say, to cut off uh, some of these trading um, supplies, uh, what that would do is it would have a, a, a negative impact on, say, some of the uh, regional farmers that we, uh, we really have developed relationships with. Um, and also, do we really want to cut off some of these uh, important relationships? So that, that is a very uh, difficult question to answer. Um, and, and the other part about uh, being self-sufficient, um, it's as I live with, with the family in Australia, 
it's a, it's a real commitment. It's like you, you have to live and breathe. Uh, you have to sacrifice a lot of things. Um, so the, a question is for us is also, what are we willing to sacrifice? So your, your question is, um, how much can we achieve this uh, increase in production? So I think the answer to that is, uh, we, we probably can achieve, I, I'm just throwing out a number, we could probably achieve anywhere from 10 to 50%. But the real question is at what cost? Right, because uh, Singapore has achieved self-sufficiency in some food products before. In the 60s, uh, we were self-sufficient in uh, pork production. But the cost that it came with is uh, huge environmental uh, degradation. So all that manure had nowhere to go. It polluted our rivers and streams and all that. Which is why eventually, uh, when, when the country decided to reprioritize um, into moving into more economic development, we had to remove the, the pig farming. So, we can increase the number, but uh, it will also mean that there's going to be more energy resource intensive. There's probably going to be more waste. And will we just be doing it blindly, just as a processing facility of agriculture products, right? So I think we have to track carefully on whether we, we want to do that. Now, that's a bit more of a, uh, maybe a more negative thought, but on, on a more positive thought, I think what urban farming uh, can do and has done uh, is, a, is a lot more... Um, holistic benefits to the country, right? For sure, there is an aspect of food production for nutritional needs, and it definitely fulfills that. Uh, in fact, uh, locally grown food that is zero, you know, uh, harvested straight away instead of being kept in a cold chain for days has a lot more vitamins and nutrition. So that on a health perspective, it is, it is uh, better for us. Um, also by being able to grow uh, a lot of, produce in the in a tropical region, for example, Moringa, which has like 25 times more iron than spinach uh, and lots of vitamins. We might we don't even need to eat uh, maybe oranges or, or, or other kinds of leafy vegetables when we grow a, a very hardy crop, an easy to grow crop like Moringa. So these are some of the opportunities that um, from a nutritional point of view, local production can give. Um, from a holistic uh, mental and physical well-being, uh, just being out there, you know, uh, shoveling the soil and just being around nature. Like there's numerous studies uh, that show that 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 uh, biophilic um, interaction is is good uh, for the, the body, mind, and soul. Uh, when I was at Edinburgh Garden City, we we did a test study with NPAX uh, that that proved that uh, uh, horticulture therapy can reduce stress levels and and uh, increase the the well-being and confidence of uh, people with dementia. So um, I think that is the, the gist of what I think urban farming can do. And it also helps to, to build community. And that's something that uh, Siorin is, is very passionate and speaks strongly about. Um, and I think that's the, the last part uh, I want to talk about is just the, the, the tension between this, or the comparison between uh, agri-technology uh, and, and the more traditional ways of farming. So first to unpack agri-technology, I think that's the main focus of the current agri-tech uh, scene is, is on automation and robotics. Um, the second one is on uh, bi more biological control, uh, like gene editing to make plants uh, maybe more drought tolerant or more climate resilient. And the third is and, and co uh, controlling your climate. You can control the lights, you can control the air conditioning. So, that is the current uh, focus on the agri-tech scene in Singapore. Um, the way I look at it, these are very good tools uh, to be able to, to uh, control the production, uh, but it does come at a very high cost. The energy cost is high, um, etc. But I think we shouldn't fear it nonetheless. I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that continues to develop. It's a very new industry. Uh, and I think what's important is that we learn from what uh, good value we can get out of that, the agri-tech scene. And the more traditional farming methods uh, that we experienced before, uh, mainly soil-based, I think there's a lot more human element to that where it's just basically humans uh, being out in nature and understanding and observing the, the patterns of rain, the patterns of sun, and uh, what is happening in the soil. So there's a lot more uh, human interaction. Um, and they're actually very, very environmentally friendly practices, but I think maybe uh, we'll, Xiaoyin can talk about that later. 
So the the pros of this is that um, it there are practices that does benefit the environment, but the downside is it may not produce as much volume or tonnage as some of the more intensive uh, production methods that that technology technology can can provide. So uh, there are there are pros and cons for both, and I think uh, we shouldn't. Uh, we should continue to explore how we balance the, the ratios of these different uh, methods and how we can learn from each other. Thanks, Chris. Um, I really appreciate you taking us through uh, the 30 by 30. And I, I know I, I posed a really tough question to you about whether we can become sufficient. Um, and I appreciate that you, you shared the trade-offs that are uh, that's inevitable, right? When you talk about agri technology, and um, the fact is, um, it's good to explore for Singapore um, because of uh, the pandemic. We really realize that um, we need to be innovative in order to uh, become, uh, or at least try to become self sufficient. This is uh, very evident in the water sector in Singapore, right? So we are very well aware that by 2061, uh, Singapore will not be able, probably not be able to import any more water from our neighbours. And so therefore, we put in a lot of money, time and effort to building our national taps. So likewise with food, likewise with energy, I think these are all um, uh, you know, resources that we need uh, to keep ourselves well, to, to survive, essentially, right? So um, thank you very much for that. We'll come back to the farming a little bit. And I also want to tap Sarin's um, experience with GUI. So, so after we, we uh, get to uh, Pidalas, then we'll come back to that, right? So um, uh, Pidalas, I, I would love to hear more about the foreign Gulf community from you and its relationship with food. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that I was at the um, uh, I was at the exhibition just last week, and I I, I heard um, uh, Mark, well, so affectionately they are known as Mark Ani and Mark Noni, right? But then I think their names are uh, Ro Rohani Rani and Noraini Rani. Yes. So they were talking about um, how difficult life was for them in the kampung, but it was also difficult. But then they also enjoyed learning about you know. Um, the, the natural, the native plants, uh, the medicine. So I, I was like so enamored, like looking at a video, and then they were talking to each other about uh, cat nets, uh, gill nets, ubu fish traps. <laughs> I wrote this all down on my phone, right? Um, traditional medicine. Um, is this something that through your Orang Laut um initiative, right? Um, these narratives, how have they been captured? And how do you think this helps uh, Singaporeans today to better understand um, the wrong our relationship with food, sustainability industry? Thank you for the question, Mel. Um, also, thank you for visiting the exhibition. <laughs> so just to touch on, on what you've asked, I think just to kickstart, the main objective of the project that kicks out around Laut Rashi is to share a little bit more about our culture, our livelihood, and the kind of um, things we used to do on the island itself. And I think through storytelling, through the digital means of today, I, I am able to do so. Um, thankfully, uh, we have Instagram, so I'm able to share a little bit more about um, you know, the practices that you used to have. Um, and thankfully, we also have a little bit of documentation in terms of photography. Um, I am able to just, you know, transport people to the past and share a little bit more about how the island was, how life was like. And you're right, my auntie is um, Madame Rohaini and my mom is Madame Noraini. They are the main gatekeepers of our cuisine. Um, I also want to touch on a little bit more about what Xiao Yin has mentioned recent, earlier today. Uh, she mentioned about the significance of the Sri Lankan crab or in... In the island itself, we call them uh, Ketam Bangkang. Yeah, that, that's a local name for that. Um, I think Ketam Bangkang, uh, like what you also shared, uh, we use specific traps for it. Uh, we use bubu traps. And there are different types of bubu traps. It's not only um, one specific type. There's various ones. So the bubu trap that we use is bubu trap for darat, which is more towards um, the reef area. Um, there is also bubu trap for deep sea fishing. So for example, if you want to catch some type of fish, such as the puffer fish, 
um, we would use the booboo trap to actually place in the middle of the ocean and wait a couple of days to catch a puffer fish. Yeah, um, touching on a bit more on puffer fish. Um, puffer fish, it is such an important um, dish to us because we do know how to poison the puffer fish. We know how to uh, cook it in a way that it is really delicious. And it is a delicacy to us. Um, of course, you know, the narrative of today is that power fish is only fugu and it is only like a, a Japanese cuisine. Um, you, you have it with sashimi. Um, but as an orang lao, um, the papa fish itself, we would eat every single part of a power fish. Um, of course, excluding the, the skin. Um, so what we would do is we would double boil the innards of the papa fish. We would uh, cook the liver of it um, it is the pettiest part also they mentioned that you know this would be the most toxic but it's actually very delicious to us and for many many years uh, we have honed the craft of how to cook this the puffer fish and when we cook it it is such a huge event because we have to coordinate with our family members um, out of like the many family members that we have um 10 aunties and uncles only one uh, knows how to depoison puffer fish and I worry this kind of skill sets that are dying within my family because uh, his eyesight is giving away. So as a far as I'm allow it, uh, would we be able to still continue eating puffer fish uh, because this is such an important um, meal to us, right? And my mom knows how to cook it. I think the preparation work takes a, a lot of time. I think about uh, a day or two just to prepare the puffer fish itself and cook it and we'll distribute it to the rest of the family members. Yeah, I think uh, touching on the, your question as well, how was, like, how was life like at the island itself? Um, they, would, they would of course say it would be really difficult for them um, because, you know, as an orang laut, uh, my auntie would say, you cannot be lazy, you have to work hard for your sustenance, you know, because you only have um, one, one um, area that actually gives you food, which is the sea. And they rely heavily on the sea. And during monsoon season, when we can't go out to sea, they would actually work with the local um, tuck shop owners. Um, I think they came from mainland Singapore. So they would work on some of the plantations, um, coconut plantations, pineapple plantations, and you know just to help them pick up pineapples, etc. And sometimes um, when we do have additional fish, right, we would in fact butter with the tuck shop owners. Um, how, how we butter is that they would give us rice, they would give us oil that we could actually use for cooking. Um, I think Xiaoyin, you're right. I think butter trade was alive and well back then. And I think crab um, were one of the items that we used to butter as well for um, the main, mainlanders. Uh, there are also some specific species of seafood that were actually requested um, from the mainland. Um, so my family would actually look into uh, sea cucumbers, for example. So uh, there are many uses for sea cucumbers. I think um, rightly so you have mentioned that sea cucumbers is such an important part of our life, right? Uh, because we actually consume them. Uh, my grand, great grandmother used to be a midwife on the island. So we depended a lot on um, local herbology and also uh, seafood. Um, so if let's say someone has just given birth, we would use the sea cucumbers um, as a way to cure internal bleeding. So they would have it raw, um, little bit, um, just add a little bit of spices to it, um, some grated coconut, and they would just have it raw because they believe that, you know, the silk cucumber, when you actually cut them into half, you put it in the water, they would attach themselves again. So they would believe this is the kind of things would happen internally as well. And this has been a belief that they've used for many, many years. Um, when they first got back to Singapore, I think when my mother just given birth to my younger sister, she had it as well. And at point in time, I was about, um, I think seven years old, if I remember correctly. And I tried, um, you know, the raw cucumber. And that, it tasted really delicious. I was like, what is this? I said, oh, it's just cucumber, sea cucumber with sambal. And I was like, oh, it tastes really delicious. But she said, oh, it's uncooked. So what? And I, that actually <laughs> changed. I actually changed completely in terms of like uh, how I consume cucumber because I was, I felt a little bit um, disgusted by it at the point in time, you know, like, cooked means good, but uncooked means like raw. So yeah, but I, I would go back and 
devour it again because it really tastes really delicious. So um, yeah, I think uh, just touching on on how life was like, it is very backbreaking. Um, but of course, in terms of whether it is easier on them, it would be because if you were to compare life in Singapore before they were displaced in 1977, um, they didn't had any debts, right? So for a family of about 12 people living on the island itself, really relying on um, seafaring methods and the, the fishing methodologies just to survive and asking them to adapt in Singapore, in mainland Singapore, uh, where they had to live you know, in a concrete jungle, so it was very difficult for them. So uh, that's why they took up like a two-room flat uh, with the fear of that they do not want to take on any debts. And it's, it's something so alien to them, the concept, um, owing people money because they believe to just get sustenance just for themselves. And it, I, I don't think the concept of overfishing or, you know, was, was, was there for them um, because they really get what they need and uh, just live for the day. Yeah. I hope that answers your question, Melissa. Absolutely, it, it really does. And I think this takes us back to the title of this uh, panel, right? Which is we are how we eat. And if you know how to essentially grow your own food, catch your own food as with the own our community, I think that um, like your, your aunt and your mom said, right? You cannot be lazy. And um, although it's backbreaking, as you say, but I think that's also, as Chris mentioned earlier, there's a lot of... Um, you can also derive physical activity from it and perhaps you could say that just a lot of Singaporeans are, are detached from how their food is being caught and processed and made and it's just imported that then it results in a lot of waste because you don't know how much effort it took to catch it and to, to, to grow it um, and you don't have that, that um, direct interaction with the, the land, the sea, and so on. So I think this is something that um, certainly this panel is trying to unpack a little bit more and try to understand how can we tell these stories better? How can we relate um, our experiences uh, with food a bit better to Singaporeans so that we can um, collectively address the climate crisis and the environmental crisis that we're in? So I would love to take the, question, um, take the discussion back to farming, right? Urban farming. And, and here I, I want to check in with Chris and, and Sayun uh, because I, I do know that both of you are involved, um, Sayun of course, in uh, Ground Up Initiative. Perhaps you can share with us a little bit more about um, uh, the farm over there and how you're involved. And Chris, for you, I know you're working on a Serangoon uh, top farming initiative and I know you were up really late last night um, uh, because the soil is coming in today, right? Like, uh, and so a bunch of uh, volunteers in, in the in Serangoon were actually with pails and saw some photos this morning uh, on our group chat. So perhaps you can share with us a little bit more about um, the initiative. But let's, let's start with Sarin first. Yeah, hey, thanks Fidelis for the sharing. And I think it really like captures for me like this quote I was I read from a book by uh, Michael Pollan called The Omnivore's Dilemma. It says, our eating turns nature into culture. It really like, you really ca captured it, <laughs> right? So to GUI, um, GUI is quite a big space. Um, it's like uh, the size of about four football fields. Um, and so when we first went on that piece of land, it used to be um, bottle tree park. So it didn't used to be farming grounds at all. And the soil was very um, infertile and very dry and very hard. Um, and of course, the farmers took a long time to understand the ground. This is part of um, natural farming where basically you have to, you don't use any fertilizers, no insecticides, no pesticides. Um, fertilizers, as in no chemical fertilizers, but of course we use um, food waste, uh, compost, um, dried leaves, um, and orange rinds that we get from, you know, your island-wide eye, eye juice machines. So that's that's what we use as, as fertilizers. Um, so of course, it took very long to actually um, understand the soil, understand the, the conditions of, of that place. Um, and right now, I would say that we, we are still not a production farm. So um, we definitely don't have like 100 kgs of any vegetables in a single week. But we do have like a huge variety because it's like... Um, it's like we just grow whatever fits that spot um, based on the farmer's guidance, not me. Uh, I just execute. Um, and of course, we also do like crop rotation, whereby if we have grown sweet potato here, then next round we we'll grow like something like gang kong because it's to do with how like how long or short the roots are and how which nutrients they take up from the ground uh, at, 
in that growing cycle. And then after three um, rounds of like growing that crop, we would like put legumes. Legumes are things like uh, beans, all kinds of beans. Um, could be butterfly pea or could be like uh, sun ham, etc. Because legumes actually um, help to rejuvenate, rejuvenate your soil. They actually convert nitrogen from the atmospheric form into a form that is soluble for the plant roots. So that's generally how, how they do it. Um, of course, it's extremely um, labor intensive. I think um, we went, uh, we purposefully and <laughs> went in that direction. Um, our late founder believed in um, getting everyone together um, in a community to, to work on the ground together. So we all use chancos and um, every Saturday, like today, um, there'll be volunteers there. Um, and the community, I mean, the organization is still 90% run by volunteers. So I believe, um, back to the 30 by 30 question, GOI's main contribution to this national goal, right, is actually to, um, is from the community and social aspect, right? Because it's a collaborative food production and provisioning method, whereby, um, you know, at the end of every at the end of every harvest day, which is three times a week, um, the people around the neighborhood uh, would come or the volunteers would just take, I mean, sell, I mean, buy the produce and bring it back home. Um, and it's basically a lot of intangible benefits, even if the food, uh, even though the vegetables is not like 100% of all the, the household needs. Yeah, because um, actually it teaches, it's an education space. Um, we educate the volunteers, we also educate participants who come here to learn about food production. So they appreciate the amount of work that goes into it. So how to mix your soil, make your compost, how do you harvest? Um, you know, certain vegetables, you don't harvest the entire thing. Like Kailan, you, you keep the last two stocks so that they can continue growing for three more times. Um, yeah, so that's one example. And of course, um, it has promoted the incubation of these urban farming practices, right? So that's that's benefit one, I think, social learning, so that, you know, when they go back home, they can start growing their own farms in the HDB corridors. I think secondly will be, as I mentioned, like the social compact of doing farming together. So everyone is really motivated to, to help, I mean, to help out and enthusiastic to learn. And I think finally would be maybe um, how we actually um, cook plant-based meals in our kitchen. Um, which is generally, of, of course, lighter and healthier on the environment. And for many of our volunteers, this one plant-based meal a week is, is the segue for them to go into a more plant-based and less carbon-intensive diet because they realize that, um, you know, when they eat the, the vegetables to just harvest, they realize that, you know, vegetarianism is actually can be delicious, can be nice. And I think there's something about how after volunteering, right, all kinds of food is nice, including vegetarian food. So uh, we often say that GUI has the best vegetarian food in the whole country. I think it's really because we very, very shack. So yeah, I think that's, that's GUI la for, for the 30 by 30 goal. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the food tastes nicer as you suggest, right? Because you worked so hard for it. Yeah, maybe Singaporeans would appreciate food more if they worked hard for it. <laughs> So Chris, over to you. All right, thanks, uh, Mel. Um, so the the great sorry the gorilla garden. It, uh, I was gonna say the gorilla garden because uh, how this rooftop garden came about was because of this uh, slightly illegal uh, activity that I did. Basically, I was during COVID period. I was quite bored. Plus, I I thought you know this food supply issue. So why don't I just start growing food for the community? I did some math. You know, if a if a papaya tree can can produce hundred fruits a year, if I just grow a whole plantation, I can feed the whole Serangoon North neighborhood, lah. So I just started doing that. Uh, and long story short, I got caught, uh, and I, I got asked to evict the <laughs> the spot. But uh, I, I tried to convince them uh, that I really wanted to do something for the community. And lo and behold, the town council was very receptive, and they said, "Hey, look, love your idea. MP loves your idea. There's this rooftop garden. Are you interested to take it up?" And, and basically, uh, it, was, it was really amazing space and, and we've just started uh, work on it. And through that, um, through that process, uh, that's MP Leon helped uh, me to recruit volunteers and Mel is actually one of the, the core team members. Uh, and so the vision for the garden is that we want the space to, to really be like a, a placemaking space, a space that is more than a garden. Uh, we want to uh, bring people together and, and Mel has started some different initiatives. She, she suggested a, a free book library where children, people can come and donate books and, 
Uh, and so that's what we did. So uh, we, we started fabricating the, the library ourselves and uh, it's ready. Um, and so our garden also is going to be open. Uh, we don't want it to be fenced like all other gardens. Uh, we want to use this as a so social experiment to see whether we can uh, trust people enough to, to take ownership of the space. Uh, and we also want to grow crops that can be taken copiously. Like if, you, if somebody wants to steal the plant, like go for it because there will be too much <laughs> of it anyway, stuff like pandan. Um, and I think the, the, the broader vision is that I see a lot of potential spaces that could potentially be converted into uh, urban gardens like this. Uh, so the, the gorilla garden that I, I was asked to evict, uh, MP was very kind to say, actually, you can, I'll let you stay on. <laughs> so now I have both downstairs gardens, uh, the downstairs and upstairs garden. So I, I do see that if we could start converting all of these spaces into, into edible gardens, uh, not only can we, uh, like what Sarin said, involve the community and let them take ownership of it, but it can produce uh, food at the same time and this is built that whole network of social interaction and, and community spirit so I think that that's just and the, the current uh, progress of the garden um, and I think we just I just want to share one one really heartwarming story about uh, this interesting interaction so uh, the garden that we have already has existing plants like pandan but the soil is not good and the pandan is the whatever plants that are not healthy it's not probably the most well-designed garden for, for edible garden. So we, we, we wanted to remove the plants. And as we are doing that, uh, this garden is actually connected to a quite a new um, elderly uh, estate. So uh, everybody living there is above 60 or 70. So anyway, as I was clearing the pandan, there, there were some uh, aunties that came down and they were very, very furious. They're like, why are you, why are you cutting down the pandan? Like, this is for us to use. Um, and like, hey, should be grew this for us. And it's like, you, you can't remove it. Um, and so we're a bit, uh, caught by surprise. Uh, but later we, we explained to them our intention of the space, um, how we wanted to give back to them. And we gave them a pandan and they were super happy. They called for their whole gin gang to come down and <laughs> everybody was like grabbing pandan. Uh, and then they, they started to open up and they, they were really uh, uh, yeah, happy with what we we're doing. And one of the aunties actually said that she uh, she separated from her husband because uh, she was too intense. So she's living alone at that block. And she enjoys gardening. And um, uh, when she saw what we were doing, and, and uh, you know, I said, look, you, we would like you to be involved as well. Uh, she almost teared up because she, she felt like she had some value um, to, to, to give. And she had also like nothing else to do, honestly, every day, just tending to a small garden. So uh, the more, like, this was very inspiring. And I, and I do see that as a, uh, as, something special about what these urban community gardens can do if we uh, really tap on the, uh, the aspirations of every individual. Chris, that's a very heartwarming story. And I know also for, um, for you, it's, it's particularly uh, valuable because you live nearby, right? Like literally a stone's throw away. And so I'm sure this is also like a project that you do um, you know, in, improves your community and the community spirit um, where you live. Um, and likewise, I know you, I like how was, was super passionate about um, going GY's community and family and, you know, we all miss him uh, very much. So, um, right now we, we can move into the, we're going to, going to move very quickly into the Q&A segment. So I hope all of you are populating the Slido with your questions. Um, I just wanted to give the, the panelists a chance to, if you guys have any questions for each other, perhaps uh, time before we segue into the, the, the Q&A. Do you guys uh, have any follow-up questions from each other's sharing just earlier? Okay, I see uh, Chris, Chris, you have yourself. Yeah, uh, just very uh, inspired by Farada's uh, sharing and I'm just uh, very curious of like how, how is, is there more of these uh, lessons that we have over the generations learned on how to eat off the land and how, how is there any movement or anything that, uh, or how can we support <laughs> this movement to, yeah, to keep that tradition? Um, so I think, you know, what I'm sharing is more towards like the perspective of 
and around our community living in Pulau Semakau. Um, eventually, I hope that the fourth generation around our community um, coming from other southern islands um, would be able to share their stories as well. Because right now, I feel that I feel a little bit alone um, <laughs> in this area, and I hope to inspire other individuals as well to share their stories. Um, but of course, you know, I, I do not want to represent the entire Rangla community. I cannot. Um, so I'm sharing the perspective of what my family knows, and I I want to be able to just um, reclaim our narrative that Pulau Macau is more than and a landfill, basically. It's more than a landfill, and I think. The important thing of how you guys could actually uh, support is basically share a story. Uh, that is what I would say. And I, I use food as a vehicle, right? And it is that one thing that connects us to everyday Singaporeans, I believe. Um, it's the easiest way as well, like what Xiao Yin has mentioned. And I am, I am um, really open to any ideas if you guys may have and how I could actually get any kind of support from the community because this is something I kickstarted only in September last year. So I'm hoping that this movement would you know, go beyond what it is now. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how you could support right now, but uh, yeah, if you want to, please let me know. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Thanks so much uh, for that. Actually, in fact, there was a question that was posted in Slido about um, the available voluntary projects to support your initiatives. So perhaps uh, what we can do is we'll consolidate um, them and we'll ask EFOS to help send out to the people who signed up today, uh, if that's okay with, with our panelists. So um, what we can do also in the Q&A on Slido, right, is actually you can upvote your, especially like a light, function almost. So you can upload the questions and um, what we'll do is um, we'll go um, uh, we'll, we'll pick the questions that have been the most upvoted I guess, right? That's sort of democratic. Um, so the first question I would love to ask that has five votes is from Rina. And Rina asks, as we, come, as we become more aware of the food we eat, is there a risk of fetishizing, fetishizing traditionally slash locally grown food? Will this affect what chefs cook or what growers grow? I wonder, um, I would imagine, Chris, would you like to take this question first and then we can ask Sarun and put us to think about the question? I think we should absolutely fetishize, fetishize and be absolutely 100% uh, uh, passionate and, and uh, go all in into advocating uh, locally grown and native um, foods because uh, there just isn't enough uh, awareness and education of it. To be honest, like probably two generations have lost the knowledge, uh, even though it's right in front of our eyes and has always been there. So I think uh, ultimately it's like the end goal of, of it is to, to be able to increase the appreciation and understanding of how to use these different um, uh, vegetables, herbs, uh, spices, um, and and then, it, that, then it will be normalized. And so I think it, we shouldn't worry too much about it being perceived as, you know, like hipster or something like that. Um, and, uh, the, and the reason for it is um, these crops, I mean, there are a lot of things that grow really, really well with very, very little input. And also the flavors of some of these things are amazing. So I, I just one, one um, herb that I, that I really love, it's called uh, Ulam Raja. Uh, I think in Bahasa, it means king of, Salad, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and it has a green mango flavor. So it's very like lightly fruity. Uh, and how it's been used, from what I understand, it's also been uh, like chopped up finely and mixed in, in uh, this dish called nasi ulam. Uh, it's like a rice herb salad. And the flowers are also very, very aromatic and flavorful. So this is something that is so special and so unique. Um, and we should be proud of it. I think like everybody in the whole world should know that this amazing crop exists. Yeah. I love I love Chris's answer. I yeah, I really think we should, yeah, really support local food. Um, it has also got to do with our our national history. In fact, right now I think there's a fetishization of like agrotech. We are importing so much to support our 30 by 30. Um, and I kind of feel like it has to do with the fact that we don't know our roots, which is that we used to have a lot of small family farms. So um, 
most Singaporeans would know that we are a huge exporter of rubber, pepper, and gambia in different parts of our national history. Um, rubber, especially, we were the reason why like there were so many rubber plantations around the world because Henry Ridley like, smuggled seeds out of Singapore. But um, actually, there was a diversity of subsistence crops that are now making a comeback in all these urban farms around Singapore that because they take well naturally to the soil, so like Ulam Raja, yeah, pandan, coconut cloves, lemongrass, um, blue pea flower, um, sweet potato, yam, cabbage, all these grow very well and it won't be expensive. I think that's the main thing about fertilization. Maybe there's a concern about cost, but I think if, if, is it, if it grows well and there's a huge supply, I, I hope we can keep costs low. I think that's the main thing. We don't want it to be an equity issue. Um, and so if we can understand our this local history of growing vegetables well, whereby up to 1984, family farms were meeting like 25% of national needs for vegetables, then we can rely less on agrotech. You know, right now it's like, um, it's like uh, it's the natural, natural choice, natural assumption that when you talk about 30 by 30, you definitely have to use technology, but we actually have to strengthen this local um, core so that we have a diversity of ways of growing. Yeah, and that actually improves the resilience of the entire food system. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I, I actually didn't know this uh, statistic about um, up to 1984, family farms were actually supplying so much uh, of our local food. It's very curious, yeah. is it because of land, like constraints that they shrunk? Um, I'm, I think it was just, yeah, as, as Chris said, it had to do with like... Um, with national development, it was decided that the farmers belongs to um, like a more backward, it's deemed as a more backward job. Um, and they, yeah, they changed the land use. So um, the pig production as well as vegetable production was slowly phased out. Um, and this, for this statistic, I think you can read um, The End of Farming by Cynthia Chow, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent suggestion. Uh, we'll definitely pick the book up. So as you were answering that question earlier, um, we had one more question that was upvoted, super fast and furious. Um, uh, this is a question about Alpia. And the question, uh, there are two questions within this question. The first is, what are the possibilities of a community garden as a commons? How do you decide who owns which plots and how to distribute the harvest? I, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think there, there should not be a silver bullet solution. I think uh, every garden will have its different um, ways of management and different, uh, maybe it should be a conversation for like each, the objective of each garden and the gardener and gardening team, right? Let's say they, they sit down and say, okay, this is our intent of the garden. And if it's, uh, we want to grow food for ourselves, for within this people in the, in the community, then this is how we choose to manage it. Uh, then for maybe some other groups that they want to keep it more open, uh, like for example, our group, then there's a conversation to be had internally. I think it's, I, probably there needs to be some form of mediation. There probably needs to be uh, yeah, some, some policing of, in, in case some people like do something crazy or build structures that may not be safe. So there, there needs to be a bit of that. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I do feel that the current model is uh, possibly a bit too exclusive where everything is fenced up. And I, I think uh, there are already a thousand of these community gardens or more than a thousand. So I think maybe what we can do is to encourage more that are not fenced up. Um, but I know that's not really giving a clear answer. So the answer is I don't really know how to manage it. But I think the, for me, where, how I manage uh, I mean, there's this book I'm reading, How to Manage Difficult Conversation. And I think there's going to be a lot of that. And then the reason why most community gardens fail is because the, it's mostly political and, and that, that's not being managed well. It's like one, one leader wants to do everything and he, he just, other people don't have a say. So maybe what needs to be done is more people have a say in, in, in more spots are, are opened up. Yeah, that's a really good point. I remember when we were applying for the community in Blue, is it like a grant, right? Like a fund or something. And then we we had some instructions, or you had some instructions that were given to you by our colleagues at Parks, right? I mean, these were mainly for pest control, right? And um, the fact that the soil was, um, based on their understanding, is contaminated. And therefore, they, they listed a few things that we had to do if we wanted to tap into the funding. So in, in, in some way, that's also... Um, 
an intervention right uh, from the government even though it is a community garden um, there are still specific rules that you still have to abide by if you want to tap into um, particular funds uh, resources and so on this is a, a very interesting point. Um, I love this question. Uh, it certainly um, helps us to think a little bit more into um, who really owns, I mean, we, we call it community gardens, but like um, the fact that a group goes in and this group may or may not stay there, right? Um, and so the aunties like coming down from their boss, hey, what are you doing with our pandan? I mean, that to me, um, it is also about who claims it or who claims it first, right? And we certainly need to investigate a little bit more as to how this happens um, and whether we can uh, make sure that everyone has a stake and everyone can continue to enjoy uh, the garden as well. And I, I do get a bit distressed also when I see the fenced up garden stuff, to be very honest. Uh, I, I walk past park connectors where it's like, oh, lock and key, and you're like, huh? What like that? Yeah, so um, I'm just glad that our rooftop, this is like a rooftop garden, it's not fenced up, anyone can go there, and uh, hopefully it will be, be kept that way. So um, let's move on to the next uh, highest vote question. Uh, it's by Nick, and Nick asks, how do we talk about food in a way that is not gentrified or privileged, uh, but possibly more inclusive, whether it's film, art, or even discussions like that? I would love to, to pose this question to Fidel's because your um, initiative actually um, is, is doing storytelling. So perhaps um, um, if you could share with us a little bit more about, and I, I know you did earlier, but elaborate a little bit more about your approach, your strategy to making um, telling stories about food and culture and history more inclusive. Thanks for the question. Um, I think the question is a loaded one, but uh, <laughs> um, food, my approach to food is more towards um, how we perceive food as a culture in general, allow it, right? And to us, food is more than just something that we eat over dinner or lunch. It is something that has a story behind it. And in a way, if you were to look into the kind of type of food that we have, right, it reflects the kind of life that we used to have. Uh, the fishing methodologies, um, the kind of livelihood that we used to have on the island itself. So to make it more inclusive, um, I've of course tried to relate it to the Singaporean context as much as possible and try to talk about how, you know, our culture and our food is part of this um, as, as far as the history as a whole. And I think just to share with you more, some examples about how I think food could really bring people together, right? Um, recently on our social media channel around Laut Ashi, I've actually shared a photo of a uh, Belimbing uh, Bulo, which is a different species or a different type of uh, the star food. And actually locally grown in Singapore and also the island itself. So how we use the building bolo is with asam pedas, uh, we cook it asam pedas, but today it's a little bit hard to find. Um, so my uncle actually found this tree just really near to our area and he took a couple just foraging it and passed it to my mom and we cook asam pedas with it. And when we posted it on the social media, I was very surprised to see that, you know, there's a lot of other Singaporeans sharing their stories about Balumbong uh, Bulo. So, sorry, it's a mouthful. Balimbing Bulo tree within the area itself. And also they talk about how, uh, for example, in Katong, right, there used to be this huge Balumbong uh, Belimbing Bulo tree uh, that was actually commonly owned by the, the, by, by the community. So they would actually go to the tree and they would just pluck the trees as and when they need it. And I think it was such a beautiful story. And I think more and more people were just sharing it. And also there are some trees that are still around in Singapore. And some of the members are actually uh, she's still sending me photos, uh, telling me about, oh, by the way, the Belimbing tree, Bel Belimbing tree is still here. Um, I've just taken a couple today, blah, blah, blah. So um, I think in a way, food should bring people together and we should be able to use food as a vehicle to talk about our past, our futures and what it means for Singapore. Hey, wonderful. Um, thank you so much, it's a really nice uh, story actually. Uh, I was looking at your front or touch Instagram page actually as you were sharing that and yeah, there's a picture of um, some fish and it looks really delicious. Um, okay cool so thank you so much for that and so let's uh, take another question. Um, 
Uh, there's one question from Tiyun I thought I would, I would like to ask. Um, she asked, has your relationship with food changed after working on whatever you're working on now? So, Chris, with your urban farm, Sarin with GY, and I know you already explained it earlier, right? Um, and Kudal certainly with, um, uh, with your storytelling. Uh, and how have you, how have your relationship with food changed? Anyone can go first. Since I work closely with food, I can take this on. <laughs> um, so I think uh, the relationship with food is a really special one. And especially growing up with the island itself, right, I, have I was taught how to, you know, fish for my own food and look into the kind of food that actually can be eaten or not. And I think my grandparents have taught me the value of food. Because, you know, to just catch a certain fish, you got to wait a couple of hours sometimes. And it gives me the kind of appreciation um, from when I caught it to I excitedly wait for my grandmother to cook it and we eat it as a family. So it's, in a way, it's, it means so much more because I know this, where the sauce comes from and what it means to me and my family. Um, while, working at Orang, while working on Orang Laut, actually, I think for me, food, right now is something so important because I'm able to share this part of my history with other Singaporeans. And I hope that through food, they will be able to, you know, understand a little bit more about our culture, or understand that food actually shape how we live um, at Los Macau and also possibly some of the other islanders uh, in the Southern Islands as well. Thanks so much. Um, we actually have a follow-up question for you, um, Dallas. Uh, Alfian asked, um, looking for the question now, um, if there were any plans to record and document the Orang Lawa community knowledge beyond the um, initiative that you have, for example, he says, um, in the form of recipes. Uh, he, he mentions that there's a book on Orang Asli recipes. That's a great question. Um, so, I think there are a few things that I'm currently working on. One of it is to just really record through oral interviews of my family members, how we used to live, the fishing methodologies and the recipes and also beliefs, right? I think the Orang Lua community, our beliefs are a bit different from people who live on the land and we have utmost respect for the sea. And also it's really evident on the kind of um, things we do before even going to the sea. Um, I shall not go into details, but I think also this project allows me to be exposed to other communities. So there's this guy, uh, one from Ubin. So he's recording stories from Pulau Ubin and sharing lesser known stories of the original people of Pulau Ubin. And I hope um, through this project itself, I'm able to you know, work with people from other islanders, other islands, and just share a bit more about collectively share what we know and our methodologies and look into like um, from the island's perspective, I look into uh, various aspects of things such as beliefs, culture, and whether there's any uh, you know, cross culture based on our research. Um, so this is like an ongoing project. I only started this like a few weeks ago. So I hope that um, it receives more momentum and we are still in the midst of looking for other individuals who used to live on the island and I think it's going to take a long time to actually research but um, I'm happy to say that the work has started. Okay, cool. I think a lot of people um, on our um, Facebook live will be interested so um, maybe you can repeat that and we can also type it in the Later for everyone on Facebook Live. Uh, so, if you could repeat the initiative again, the new one. There's no official name for it now. <laughs> um, they, yeah. They so, can get in touch with you, right? The, yes, uh, they can. Um, on Instagram. Right. Yeah, you can just go to Orang Laut SG on IG or you can just drop us an email at hello at Orang Laut SG. Fantastic. Okay, I, I have this question that um, is, is like just popping up at me. Um, and I think it's for Chris because uh, it says, it's by Anonymous. What is your secret to convincing the MP to let you grow the urban garden? <laughs> and our, uh, the MP is actually Leon Pereira. 
Uh, you need some really good PowerPoint presentation skills and pretty pictures. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I don't know. Um, my, I just did a PowerPoint presentation, honestly, uh, and uh, I just spoke very honestly about, about my intent. Um, and I think it was just very, very uh, fortunate that uh, MP Leon's um, value system is very aligned, where he is super community uh, focused, and he just wants to bring people together. So uh, any reason to that is good, that matches that, and this happened to be a perfect match. Um, so that, that was a win. Yeah. Yeah, so if anyone out there wants to set up a community garden, she really do go and speak to um, your MP, la, I would imagine, right? Um, not always the MP, right? Sometimes the town council, first the town council, doesn't always have to go to the MP. That's yeah, I, I think uh, when one door closes, you got to find the back door, the side door. So like the, at first, the front door closed and they said, shut it down, pull it out. And then I, I just tried my luck many other ways. La. Uh, yeah, just keep trying. You, you might find a way. If you need, if you need any like, specific advice, feel free to reach out to me and I'll see whether I can teach you some little tricks <laughs> of the trade. Yeah, I mean, I just, just to give you the context, um, when I was with Edible Garden City, I was work, very fortunate to work with, uh, with this visionary called Beyond. And he, he will have to use his, he used his creativity a lot to convert all these existing random commercial spaces into gardens. So that required a lot of uh, convincing. And uh, I think that the, the trick is how you, can you convince the, the other person who tends to be very risk adverse, whether they are town council or MP or uh, management, that what you're doing can add value to them, make them uh, successful in whatever they are doing. And at the same time, reduce the amount of risk that they bear. So for my garden, I, I knew that they were, the town council would be very uh, concerned about maintenance issues. You know, if there's mosquito, if there's water pipe break, break, breaking, uh, who's going to be responsible for that and the cost? So I, I put up my hand and I said, okay, I, I will be fully responsible for all the costs. If I get fined, i put it under my name and I will uh, sign a contract to show that I, will, uh, I have this under my, my, my ownership. Uh, and should I uh, also have exit clause? La? If I need to exit, then I will reinstate the garden back to its original condition. So that for them, it's like very little risk for, for them. Yeah. That's so interesting. Uh, what a great insight, Chris. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I know we have a lot of questions still uh, remaining. Uh, we only have about eight minutes to go. So I wonder, perhaps we can take one last question and have you guys share a little bit more. Uh, and also uh, rounding up statements. Uh. Um, so I think this final question I really want to ask uh, is, someone actually sort of um, highlighted this uh, anonymous person on the on Slido. Um, how do you educate people about environmental issues, right? So I, I want you to think about uh, moving forward. How will you, um, through your work, through your beliefs and through your eating habits, how will you continue to educate um, around you um, and hope to convince Singaporeans um, not, uh, first not to consume mindlessly anymore. Do you think that's possible? And it's a very loaded question, but um, it was asked. So just sort of like, yeah, um, hopefully it represents, represents the question well enough. Um, but yeah, so for the remaining seven minutes or so, I wonder if we can uh, go in turns just to share um, for education and your hopes for the future of how we eat here in Singapore. Uh, let's go backwards to from our earlier sharing. So Fridawas first, then Chris and Xiaoyu. Melissa, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? No problem at all. So the question is, how do you educate people about environmental issues? So moving forward, how would you, um, through again, your, your, in your case, perhaps short storytelling or others, I don't want to... Uh, in a box or anything, but um, how would you continue to educate and what are your hopes for, for Singapore, Singaporeans' relationship with food? Okay, um, I think that firstly on the topic of sustainability, right, um, there's a lot of talk about parrot fish, but how, how important it is to the ecosystem. And I think for parrot fish, right, it is 
a staple for our family back then. Um, of course, we used to fish parrot fish uh, to, uh, when, when, whenever we need it, um, and then we cook, we cook some dishes out of it. I also think it's not only about educating Singaporeans, it's also about educating the community itself. So I, because some of my family members and some of the community of um, that is still going out at sea to fish, um, I, I, I would actually go out to them and just tell them that, you know, hey, uh, parrot fish is something is, that is important to the ecosystem. And we would need to able to just catch what we need and not overfish. Right. So it's also an ongoing effort for me personally to just educate my community. And also through around our SG, um, some of the seafood that I've used, I highlight that it is sourced from a person who actually helped us to catch specific quantities of what we need. Um, and also looking into what kind of offerings that we have on the weekends, right? Uh, we only go by pre-order. Um, so through food. I want to be able to really manage the quantity and not um, request additional supplies, which I don't do not need. Um, that's why I think um, the, the pre-order system really is important to me. And I think just on that note, um, sustainability is important, uh, especially someone who used to work at WF Singapore um, for about three years. Uh, I now understand better the kind of impacts that it has on the, on the environment and what we as individuals can do. But um, also my, the little thing about sustainability and culture is that uh, there is you know, the gray area. Um, do you consume it? because you have a cultural background that you use to consume such species or do you you know deter away from it so it is i think a question of balance and i feel that i am trying to go in between try to be in the middle and try to you know uh, still upkeep my traditions and keep my culture alive but at the same time have sustainability in mind thank you thank you Oh, please, yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, I would like to uh, educate people by creating a, a amazing, amazing food and having people eat it because Singaporeans know what good food is uh, and they go crazy about it. So uh, as Amel, we, we, we talked about uh, having pandan party, using excuses to create uh, avenues where we can harvest, uh, prepare food, uh, so we are going to do like a uh, uh, kaya toast um, uh, sharing, giving out to the residents as well as uh, our fellow um, uh, group member Joy was going to make a pandan cake. Um, so that's what we plan to do in a community garden. At work, uh, what I I'm, what I'm want to do is to uh, redefine uh, what people have as salads because uh, what we have is quite bland and, you know, the same old baby spinach, arugula kind of thing. So I want to use, I started using um, what, we, what I grow in, in, the, in, the, in the farm. Uh, things like marigold, uh, flowers, it gives you that really nice colors. Things like uh, sorrel that, that has a lovely purple color and it tastes very uh, uh, citrusy. So that little salad that I've created, um, um, I want it to excite people uh, and when people taste it, they, they start to appreciate it. Then they start to understand, oh, what, what is this interesting ingredient? And people are like, what? This, this, I thought this is like a weed that grows on the floor outside my house. They're like, why do you, is it? I didn't know it's edible. So that, that has gotten some interesting conversations going and I, and yeah, who knows the more we, we grow these things. And I think um, that can really change uh, the way we consume and this whole demand will change once we, we understand the value of uh, what we can grow. And, and the second part is really what do I, what, what I see food as in the future, what my hopes for it. Um, I, I think there are so many different elements from the, the, the passionate uh, hobbyist uh, gardeners um, to the uh, commercial farmers who are trying to do their best and it's not, it's not easy work uh, to produce this food with all these demands on them. Um, and you have the people in between, right? Who are some, uh, you know, small scale farmers. So I think what I hope to see is like bringing the, the networks uh, of all these different groups of people um, together so that with, with uh, more of that holistic interaction, 
uh, there is sharing of knowledge, a sharing of experiences, the whole ecosystem can be built, it can be strong, and therefore we can uh, also inspire a, a new generation of, of people to, to be interested in, in food and farming. Excellent. I have to ask you to make that salad for uh, volunteers very soon. All right, last but not least, uh, Shari, please. Yeah, hi. So I guess in sum, back to the topic of this panel, the relationship between um, food and us is very rich in Singapore. Um, but I think what we know of it, or rather what we don't know, is a result of education. And of course, um, as I mentioned, I believe in using arts and humanities for education. And if we only think of food as food, we lose so many possibilities, which is why you know both Chris and Fidel spoke about um, presenting food creatively to inspire all these other, other, um, other thoughts about food, you know, other ways of seeing food. Um, so I believe that we'll continue to make ourselves um, very palatable to a general audience. Um, yeah, for me, maybe I can at this point bring like a different angle of environmentalism, uh, environmental education that I'm doing. So for instance, like outdoor and biodiversity education. So I actually do that as well. Um, I think it's got to do with igniting curiosity and care for local fauna and flora. You know, um, sharing about how there's intrinsic value in conserving um, local biodiversity because of course food is you know this very cultured way of of na of nature of what the earth gives us um, and you must think of food as part of the greater um, goods of things that um, earth provides for us and nourishes us with um, and so you know for me that's also the other angle that I tackle it at when I look at um, when I see like a mud crab or a flower crab in the waters, like when I bring people out for intertidals, then I say, hey, do you recognize this? You don't, but you probably eat it. Um, and this is how they look like. Um, this is how they behave. And um, they're really, um, and the other in one that's interesting is like soul fish because, you know, people eat it, um, you know, they love it, but they don't know how it looks like and how it moves. Um, and so I believe that um, for me to continue doing that kind of education, you know, giving, getting people up close to nature, facilitating like natural science learning outdoors um, would continue to be important because it's not just about um, the species itself, but also like um, that actually gets people thinking about protecting the spaces that harbor these biodiversities um, in Singapore, like the natural spaces, our coastlines, our secondary rainforests, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So it only leaves me to thank um, our panelists, um, Dawes, Sarin, and Chris for sharing all of your great insights and personal stories uh, with our um, I think we had at, at the height maybe 60 plus people join us on Facebook Live. Um, I would like to also thank Ethos Books um, for bringing this panel together and the Singapore Heritage Festival. Um, please do check out the rest of the program. Please also go and check out the Human and Nature Exhibition um, at the National Library Board. And thank you all so much for sharing your, your stories with us today. Um, may we never forget um, where we come from, who we are, um, how our food is produced, and then we also never lose this fire and passion for Singapore a better place. Uh, together we can, we can, oh my god, so cliche. Okay, well, I'm going to end there. Thank you all so much and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you.